we're live. Um, welcome to the Sunday session. My name's Steve Judge. I'm the host of the Football Network World's weekly discussion with football practitioners around the world. Um, this evening, I'm joined by three top, top guests. Uh, we're here to discuss the brain game, implementing mindfulness and flow to enhance performance. Uh, the Alex Giber, he's a, a coach at FC Barcelona, also a, a sports scientist, sports science professor at EUP de Mateo. I have Amy Spencer, a sports psychologist at Southampton and Keith Kaufman. Um, if I get all of this correct, Keith's clinical sports psychologist, researcher, and author. Um, but before I get the guys to uh, tell you a little bit more about themselves, I shall share with you a little bit about uh, our plans for this evening. Uh, if I just share my screen with you. So it's... Uh, Get this up. So, the plan for tonight is that uh, once we get through the, the introduction, um, Amy, Alex, and Keith will give a, a brief presentation on, uh, on their work and background with, with mindfulness before then having a, a little bit more of a discussion on their, on their pathways into mindfulness and the, the approaches that they take with uh, implementing it uh, within their current roles uh, and sort of more into that sort of side of where they're getting the buy-in from coaches, staffs, the players that they're working with. Uh, uh, and then a little bit more that obviously people want to know that there's a feeling that, all right, this mindfulness works, but is there really any genuine evidence that it's having an impact on, on player performance uh, and fitness? Um, but before we can get to all of that, let me uh, start introducing our guests. Uh, I'll start with with Keith. Um, Keith, did I could I get that just about right? Is, did I miss anything off the list? Clinical sports psychologist, researcher, author. Uh, yeah, no, you you got it all right. Um, so I'm I'm based in the Washington D.C. area, over in the states, and I have a private practice where I work a lot one on one with athletes and and other performers. Um, and I'm also a co-founder and CEO of the MSP Institute, where we do a lot of consulting around integrating mindfulness in sport, especially around the program we developed, Mindful Sport Performance Enhancement. So that's, that's my background. Okay. Um, yourself and, and author, um, your book? So uh, we wrote a book on MSPE, Mindful Sport Performance Enhancement. Um, so it's a couple years old already, which is unbelievable. So 2018 book. And in the book, we talk all about the program. So if after this conversation or at any point, if you're interested in reading more about MSPE, you can learn all about um, the, the structure and, and actually how to, how to run it or take yourself through it. And we also talk a lot about the science of mindfulness and best practices and, and how you can use it effectively within an organization or as an individual. Okay, brilliant. And we'll certainly hear a lot more about that in the, uh, in the coming hour, hour and a half. Uh, Amy, um, almost a really great day for, for Southampton today. Oh, nearly, nearly. We, we did well. Um, but yeah, Man United just topped us. <laughs> um, yes, well, the least said about that, the better, I think. Um, <laughs> yeah, let's move on. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, so I'm just wondering if you, obviously for a, for a second time, sort of welcome back to the, the Sunday session. Um, for those you. who... who uh, Foolish enough to miss your previous appearance uh, during the lockdown. Could you could share us a little bit about your your background and, and and how you sort of came to your current role at, at Southampton. Yeah, so um, I'm one of the sports psychologists at Southampton Football Club. I'm fortunate enough to work in a team of there's five of us. Um, so again, really fortunate with that, where we've got a clinical psych on board. Um, and then different practitioners specialising in, in different elements of psychology, um, which is really exciting. I've been at Southampton for eight years now, and I'm currently studying for my PhD in mindfulness in football. So I am six years into it, into my PhD and hopefully coming towards the end. Um, so I've got real interest in, interest in how to embed mindfulness into the culture of football um, and how it can be used effectively. 
Okay, fantastic. Yes, I'm sure we'll learn a lot more of how, how that project in Southampton and your, and your PhD is, is going as we progress over the next hour and a half. Uh, and finally, um, sort of introduce you all to Alex Joubert. Alex, how, how are you today? I'm great, thanks. Um, yeah, I sort of sort of a very varied background there as sort of a, a university professor, but also um, a coach at, at, uh, at Barcelona. I just wonder if you could share yeah, a little bit of the, the details there and, and sort of how that journey has then also brought you into, uh, into being involved with the mindfulness side as well. Yeah, so I was a, a passionate, passionate footballer when I was younger. Actually, I, I played in high level in youth. And then I decided to study sports science and, and finally become a football coach, where I was eight years working for FC Barcelona, mainly as a coach, but also in the internationally in the, in the project. I've been a different coach, I would say, because my main interest always has been the player, the athlete, the communication, the leadership, you know, not, not that the tactics that most of the coaches are focused on. And finally, I was in a, in a moment in my career that I was, I was missing some knowledge and I decided to, to stop and, and starting the PhD. And is why I started working as a professor in the university as well. And the amazing path of the, of the PhD, a difficult path. And I'm like Amy, you know, now is my fifth year and so hopefully going to, to the end. And, and yeah, and just to say that um, I'm not here to talk on, on behalf of the club, not either to share the uh, information about them, but definitely willing to share my thoughts, my, my experience and my, my project. Okay, brilliant. Um, yeah, I wonder then, yeah, if you're talking of, of sharing your, your, your pathway, um, sort of hand the screen over to you, um, sort of give our first presentation of the evening and uh, uh, obviously a, a little bit of your background on, on that journey into to mindfulness and, and your approaches that you're developing. Shall I go then? Yes, yes, go for it, Alex. Go for it. Okay, let's go. So as I said, um, I didn't study uh, sports psychologist. Uh, maybe in that moment in my life, I would, I would have liked. So my approach to on my path to mindfulness has been a little bit different. I forget also to speak about my, my personal growth uh, path. I could say also spiritual path, you know, where I found activities such as yoga and meditation and self-knowledge process, which actually also brought me to mindfulness and, and wanted to put all these things together. But focusing more on, on, on my PhD, my thesis, and, and this may, but might be a little bit um, weird for some people, but I, ca I come from the paradigm of complexity and, and we were trying to understand how actually motor behavior uh, works, you know? So we started looking for the Newell's model of theory of constraints about coordination, which recently has been updated by Balaguer 2019 is an article I strongly recommend. And the question is not, is not um, anymore if the mind and body connection actually, in, for my, in my opinion, is mind, body and environment connection and how this interaction actually uh, works. We know that uh, we think we are complex structures that actually self-organize from Varela and colleagues. We live in an environment that is complex and, and dynamic with high variability and uncertainty, especially in football. You know, I know different, it's not the same running than team sports, but also the environment is complex and dynamic. And, I, and as I said, especially in football. And then this is kind of this perception action uh, process that actually from the ecological approach or the, of Gibson that says that it's direct perception, you know, where from this um, process is where actually this the emergence of motor behavior. And when I was looking at flow, for me, flow state, it was this kind of perfect perception action cycle. You know? And I was looking into this, this state. 
the literature in flow state has been related to peak performance, peak experience, motivation, creativity, learning, evolution, and even evolution, right? Here for the coaches, um, just to take in mind that the perception action cycle, which actually flow works, it's different than the instruction action many coaches are, are, are used to, you know, telling the, especially in football and the team sports, not telling all the time the player what they have to do. We need to let them play. We need to, let, we need to give them autonomy in order to reach that kind of flow states. I would go to flow and the most famous uh, nine dimensions framework from the good work of Chisholm Smihaili, which actually the nine dimensions, there are more, but the main are nine. It's a, this is the preconditions we need to know about the flow state. The, more, the, the most famous is the challenge skill balance. That means that the activity must be a little bit, the challenge must be a little bit above of my skill, not to challenge, not too difficult, not too easy. That's the, the sweet spot. In my opinion, the other dimensions are the characteristics of, of being in flow state where merging the action awareness is actually one of the main cited, as you can see the percentage from the systemic review of Swan et al. Um, 2012. Sense of control, time transformation, unambiguous feedback that in some places you find it that precondition, I think is actually a characteristic of flow state. And there are two more that for me are key in about mindfulness. One is total concentration and is actually the most cited, or it was at least in 2012 before, the most cited dimension. And loss of self-conscious for me is the result of this total concentration that we for sure will be getting into in, in later in this, in this seminar. These two, for me, this is the key to access the flow state and it's mindfulness. And it's not just concentration. Normally people get in a, in a, in a wrong concentration, you know, too much information, too focus, you know, it's too concentration. It must be a little bit of relaxed concentration. You know, that, that principle of non-striving, it's working on mindfulness, it works very well. Then the ninth dimension is the autotelic experience that is like the experience itself. Is, uh, it's, uh, it's rewarding by itself. And I would like to add here, the flow follows focus that I found it from the Flow Genome Project, another project that if you're interested, you can look at. Flow follows focus. And I said it's, it's, it's a specific focus that you learn in, in mindfulness. They also um, talk about the four phases, struggle, that is related to the challenge we are facing. But the most important thing is release before flow. So is this kind of relaxed concentration and it's another, I th I'm sure Keith will talk about it in the MSP is one of the key performance facilitator, the relaxation. Athletes needs to know how to relax, how to, how to be in the perfect, in the sweet spot between anxiety and boredom. And you can do this with being mindful and the mindful techniques. And just to finish, would like to share my, my vision of and my thesis, what's going on now. You asked at the beginning about how it can impact performance, how it can impact fitness, how it can impact well being. And for me, it's so important to understand how this concept and which are the relationships of these concepts. You know, normally we are looking for the flow state, you know, and the paradigm shift for me is that in sports, we, we, we must start looking for the long term uh, decisions in order to get stability. You know, as you can see, these gears, every gear moves at different speed. So for example, the flow is fast changing and it's unstable, but the well-being, of course you can have an accident or something that you can change very, very abruptly, but normally are states that change in a different time scale. The flow, the self-management that you can get the, the fitness, you can get the good habits, but to finally be in the, in for me, the gear that move everything that is the well-being. That for me, the goal must be a long lasting sports career. In order to get that in mindfulness, how can we find the tools we said? 
flow it's clear attention all being clear to to can manage the attention i need the self regulation skills both emotionally emotionally and attentionally but for me another key is all the values is all the so no the self knowledge the attachment the beliefs in order to align thought feeling and action and just to finish with this so the target must also we need to also be 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 aware of the team. we cannot just impact the player or the athlete we need to also to impact the team the coaches the staff with the concept of interpersonal mindfulness i found very interesting but finally we need to actually uh, impact the culture of the club and hopefully one day to change to change also the the culture you know of society so finally in my opinion this is the top down you know we we need to start looking for this well-being this value system and actually the club structure in order to impact finally to the here and now performance that it's also what we all we all want and from here and from here Thank you, Alex. Yeah, that's uh, fantastic. Yeah, nice uh, introduction into uh, into your your work and your thoughts and, and your approaches to to mindfulness and, and and flow state, which yeah has given us a nice foundation to to work with in the next hour or so. Um, but before we're able to do that, it's, uh, I would like to sort of bring Keith to the fore. Um, let Keith take over the screen and. Uh, share with his uh, approaches on on implementing uh, mindfulness within sports arena all right can everyone see that okay yes perfect all right um so i just wanted to start with a couple of hang on one sec because now i just cut off a little bit of my screen um well I just want to start with a couple of uh, quotes that I really like in terms of understanding how mindfulness might be able to fit into sport. Um, and, and so here's one from Gord Hammer just talking about, and again, I, I managed to cut myself off here a little bit. So let me pause for one second and see if I can, oops, I can just do it this way and this will, okay, now I can see everything the way I want. Uh, the benefits of mindfulness practice as applies to sports are almost blindingly obvious. Focus, awareness, clarity of thought, and the ability to stay in the present moment are basic skills for any great athlete and meditator. Um, so, you know, in terms of starting to think about the why, right, that when we developed MSPE, and we'll, we'll talk about that more, I'm sure, as we go, we wanted it to be practical. We wanted to sort of answer this question of how do we move the ball forward in sports psychology and, and thought that mindfulness was a really intriguing direction to take it in. And I think this idea that there's so much overlap between what we know is associated with peak performance, and as we'll talk about in a, mo in a moment with Flo, um, that, that that's exactly the kind of skill set that we're trying to train in, in mindfulness practice. So there's almost just theoretically this, this huge overlap. It just makes so much sense. Um, and I want to share this quote as well, because it's, it's become very impactful in how we think about mindfulness. Um, and it's from Peter Haberl, who is a colleague of ours in uh, the United States Olympic Committee, um, who said that full attention on the task at hand is the psychological currency of successful execution. It's precisely because thoughts will arise that mindfulness is so helpful. Mindfulness is not about not having thoughts. Mindfulness is about relating to thoughts more skillfully when they do arise. And I think there's a couple of ideas that are so important in this quote that, that we've really adapted within MSPE. One of them is this idea of attention as a currency, right? As, as something that's valuable, as something that's limited and precious. And that we have a choice as, as a performer, as a coach in how we spend that very precious resource. And so in mindfulness training and a training like ours, we want people to be aware of where those choice points are and how they can make the decision to be present um, as opposed to getting lost perhaps in judgments or thoughts about the past or the future. Um, the other thing I, I can speak certainly for my private practice work, but also for my consulting work, um, the idea of that mindfulness is not about not having thoughts, right? So many athletes come to me and say, 
I want to learn how not to think. And that's impossible. If you ever, you know, sit down and say, okay, don't think that that is, that is almost impossible for a human being to do. And so instead, what we're after in this kind of training is not stopping the brain from doing what it does, but learning how to understand it and how to work with it more skillfully. And especially in a chaotic environment like sport, like football, where it's emotional, we're going to be reacting to things constantly, there's going to be all kinds of opportunities for distraction, there's no way your mind's going to be quiet the whole time. So for us, it's much more about being able to see the chatter as it arises and being able to relate to it more skillfully so that you can still perform the way you want to perform. So I, I love these, these quotes just as, as an introduction to how we think about mindfulness. Um, so MSPE itself is, is an intervention program that we developed in the uh, early 2000s. It actually was part of my dissertation project and has now grown into a whole institute, as I, as I mentioned in the beginning. Um, it grew very much out of the work of John Kabat-Zinn um, and, and his mindfulness-based stress reduction program. And what we wanted to do was take some of those fundamental MBSR ideas and bring them into sport in a dynamic way. So in other words, not just teach people about mindfulness and how to strengthen their mindfulness skills, but how to pay attention mindfully while they're in the act of performing. Um, that, that's really where we see MSPE taking this big step forward in, in terms of the science of mindfulness. So we're, we're trying to strengthen these, these core skills of awareness, right? So seeing what's happening as it's happening, and then acceptance, right? So allowing things to be as they are, even though at times um, we might want situations to be different than, than they are. Um, and, and we talk about MSPE very much um, as, as what's called an anti-parachuting in model, right? So in other words, this is not the kind of thing that you can learn overnight. It's not the kind of thing you can wait until there's a problem and then, oh, let's really quickly learn mindfulness. That, that instead it's something that really requires a lot of integration, a lot of practice. And Alex spoke to that just a little bit. I'm sure Amy will speak to that. Um, and, and so there's a big commitment that's involved for people who want to do an intervention like MSPE. Um, and so we encourage people to be aware of what we call the mental training paradox, which are some of the key resistances that, that organizations, that individuals often have to, to doing a really heavily involved mental training like this. Um, I could talk for a whole hour about the mental training paradox, but I will just say by far and away, the most common barrier that we see in our work is a perceived lack of time, is this idea that we just don't have time to do something else, um, or there's so many other things that we're trying to do, we don't have time to do something like this new mindfulness practice. Um, and so a big barrier that we see in our work, and I'm sure, again, Alex and Amy could speak to, is how do we get this buy-in enough to get the access to be able to do this kind of training and, and have it be effective, right? That we're upfront with people with MSPE that if you can't make a commitment, if you can't make the time to do it, this just really can't help you. Um, and so I think that's, that's a very important part of, of any mindfulness intervention, but certainly MSPE. Um, again, I can go more into the nuts and bolts of MSPE later, but just to give a very quick overview, um, it's again, rooted in this mindfulness-based stress reduction uh, paradigm, but with the idea that we're gonna incorporate more and more movement and action as we go. So we might start with some sedentary kinds of mindfulness practices, classic things like a sitting meditation or a body scan practice. And eventually what we, what we do is train people to maintain a mindful style of attention while they're engaged in skills related to their sport. So being able to, if you're playing football, um, you know, maintain awareness, mindful awareness while you are engaged in a drill or ultimately while you are out on the pitch performing. Um, it is designed as a six session program, but it's meant to be very flexible and customizable. We recognize that different clubs, different individuals have different needs. So like Amy can speak to, she took our six sessions and extended it out into 10 sessions. And, um, so there's all different ways that you can bend and, and contort MSPE to make it fit your purposes. And that was designed that way on purpose. Um, it very much includes a balance of integration where we want people learning how to do this within their day-to-day -day activities, which we would call informal mindfulness practices, but it also does require 
um, very intentional, like setting aside a time to be able to, to do certain exercises, to do certain practices. So we call those formal meditation practices. So we, we emphasize both in MSPE. Um, and as Alex mentioned, uh, MSPE very much targets certain mental skills that we think are very important to performance. So things like concentration, being able to maintain, sustain concentration on what's most important in the present moment, um, being able to, to let go of excess tension that may arise when you're in a performance situation, um, and uh, being able to, to keep your attention centered in the moment and let go of whatever reactions um, or distractions come up for you. Also being able to find rhythm and connectivity in whatever you're doing. Um, and, and something that we also emphasize is self-compassion. So, so finding opportunities for self-compassion, which might be an interesting thing for us to discuss on this panel as well. Um, and lastly, I'll just say really quickly that uh, when we designed MSPE, we also designed it with the concept of flow in mind. And, and flow, of course, being an equivalent to this idea of being in the zone, this optimal performance space. And so this piggybacks really well on what Alex was saying that in particular, there are certain flow elements that seem to um, be targeted very nicely by our MSPE curriculum. So the, the total concentration on the task at hand, the goal clarity, transformation of time, feeling of effortlessness, loss of self-consciousness, sense of control. Um, and he mentioned autotelic experience, this, this fact that we're, we're focused on the intrinsically rewarding aspect of a performance. So, so the way we think about it is not that MSPE is a guarantee to get into flow, but rather over the course of these sessions and these practices that we introduce, we are trying to strengthen and act on those factors that impact flow and might increase your odds of being able to get into a flow state while you're performing. Um, so that is just a very quick, I tried to condense a lot of information into a little bit. So hopefully we can flesh that out, but just a very quick overview of MSPE and, and how it interfaces with flow. A uh, great job, Keith. Um, yeah, I thought that was going to be a, an impossible task to condense that down into five slides. You've managed to do it in, in four. So, uh, yeah, congratulations. Um, and, and I think that might tee up Amy perfectly as well, as you, you sort of said, mentioned that uh, Amy uh, went the other way and took six steps and turned them into 10. So uh, it'd be interesting to see how many, how many slides Amy has on, uh, on her presentation. But Amy, yeah, it's all yours. Thanks, uh, Keith. Please feel free to jump in at any point because uh, this is your program that I'm <laughs> that I'm trying to embed in uh, into Southampton. So I'm just going to uh, share with you what I did um, along with Keith, um, Carol, and Tim, the other authors of, of MSPE, um, and how we embedded it into the psychology session with it, um, with Southampton. So as Keith alluded to, it's six sessions, um, and for me to get that amount of time with the players was really impossible. So we condensed it down to our sessions and then extended it out into 10 sessions. And what was really, really nice um, is that all the staff were, were present. So you had the two coaches, you had analysis staff, you had medical, and you also had um, the S&C staff that all did the full 10 sessions, which was lovely. Um, I've written down, as you can see, kind of the sessions of what, of what we did. Um, and this is alluded to within the MSPE book, but we just extended it, like I said before. So really looking at how we take um, the formal mindfulness practice. So in our psychology lab, moving that along to um, gym based. So in the SNC, so fully gym based, like you can see in, in one of the in the photo. And then also how we then embedded that out onto the pitch. So it was a really nice transition between, I suppose, classroom based to applied pitch pitch side. Um, there was consistent themes. So once after the full 10 sessions, um, some really nice themes came out from, from the players. The usefulness of the breath as an anchor to manage the pressure out on the pitch. Um, breath as an anchor during SNC and recovery sessions. So really utilizing kind of that awareness of the body scan and bringing their attention back to the breath. They also said about increased awareness um, to be able to self-regulate their attention, um, but also their emotions, that emotional control. Really, really nice. They said that improved team cohesion 
So they understood what their teammates wanted. They understood when their teammates were heavily under pressure, when, they, when their emotions were affecting them and how they can better support them. Um, what was really interesting when discussing with Keith was the split preference between the internal breath versus the external cues as the anchors. So what we really try to put across to the players and also the staff is that you don't just have to use the breath as an anchor. You can use your feet on the floor um, and, some, and you can use the coach's um, communication or cues for anchors. And that was really nice. But ultimately, the best part of all of this, which I'm very fortunate with, all of the staff bought into it. So even though I've just put coaches in there, all of the staff have bought into it. Um, so now looking back, you've got SNC practitioners using mindfulness content. You've got um, coaches that are embedding mindfulness still out on their practices without like psychologists being there. Um, they're using, you can see that, that on the previous slides, a way to bring it into the training was using it in rondos. So really being able to get them to focus their attention and be present in the rondos. Um, it was a bit of fun, it's part of their training, but they can also practice the skill sets that have been, have been learned over this 10 sessions. As, as Keith said, the importance of um, integration, so not parachuting in. And it was really nice to have that discussion with Keith and his colleagues before applying this programme of going, actually, you've used this type of language within your book. Can we change it to this language that we use every day within our practices at the club? How can we, how can we change some of the different um, forms of communication to really suit already what the coaches and the players are using. Um, and just in terms of future directions, one was, uh, this was a couple of years ago, but implementing MSPE techniques with other players and teams at the club. And we are now doing that. So we've got four or five teams that are now integrating MSPE um, throughout their sessions, but not only out on the pitch. And I was uh, speaking to the guys before everyone came on the online. It will, it's, also embedding that in rehab sessions. So getting the physios to embed it into the rehab sessions, getting SNC coaches to embed it into their sessions, both in the warm up but also in the gym. And it's, it's really nice to see how the coaching staff and the support staff are using their own language, but really in hindsight, having the mindfulness aspects there as the fundamental and the core principle to then build on top of what they're already doing um, and it's, it's really nice to see just last week I saw one of the um, physios do a mindful movement whole an hour session with one of the injured players and it was fantastic so I was there and he said Amy interrupt if you need to or if you want to add anything but the way that he was doing it was really in tune with being present but also getting that player into flow really being able to understand how their body mo is moving how they can bring their attention back when their mind has wandered. Um, and it, it, was, it was just lovely to see that it's not just coming through me, it's coming through everyone. One really nice thing was that the, the players wanted greater emphasis out on, the, out on the pitch and they wanted more than 10 sessions. So it really just goes to show that how much they bought into it because we made it towards them. It was their language. It was them having input in the, into it. It was their accountability for really taking on board uh, the MSPE uh, techniques and, and the structure and, and really kind of running it with them themselves. Um, increased training opportunities. So I've been very fortunate to jump on uh, Keith's training, uh, training course, which was uh, really great. So learning from other practitioners around the world to go, right, what have they done in their sport? How can I utilize what they're doing and bring it back? Um, and that's why it's really great to have Alex and Keith on the call because always learning about what if I've missed something or what are they doing that I can then take into the club? Um, and then just finally, the vision of the club is to have all players across all age groups and staff practicing mindfulness daily. So again, very fortunate that we've got um, S&C practitioners, coaches, players, all having that ability to kind of practice mindfulness, whether formally or informally, having mindfulness sessions, we have mindfulness drop-in sessions. And not only that, where the club is split across two sites, where we've got the football side, but we've also got the commercial side, 
we're also embedding it into the commercial side as well. So it's not just players and uh, on pitch players and staff that have access to mindfulness. It's everyone across the whole club, which is for me fantastic because again, like Alex said, you're you're looking at that whole culture rather than just isolating the performance. And that's it from me. Keith, have you got anything to add on that? Um. So the only thing I will jump in to say is that that Amy is often very modest and I know I embarrass her often and I just want to just again commend the work that she's done when we developed MSPE we we knew that one of the hardest things would be getting people at high level of sport to commit to something like this you know at the time it was new and again we were talking before before the show here a little bit about how Alex was saying mindfulness is even regarded as cool in some circles and to me that's like wow that's that's, that's such a huge breakthrough um, but, but Amy can say she got in at the ground level before it was cool. Um, and, and it's people like who are doing this groundbreaking work and, and took these risks and brought it to her club and, and has really worked tirelessly for the last couple of years. Um, we were saying it's been years, it's amazing, um, to, to really integrate this kind of work. And it's not just MSPE, they do a lot of wonderful things with mindfulness at Southampton. Um, but just from an MSPE perspective, to see what her and the club have been willing to do and to see some of the results of that, it's amazingly gratifying as a developer of a program. So I just want to take a moment and praise and appreciate all the cutting edge and impressive work that you and your club are doing, Amy. Because um, I know Thanks, you wouldn't Amy. say that on your own. <laughs> but otherwise, I agree with everything you said. I thought you did great. So. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, that was some uh, really interesting and, and encouraging stuff, Amy, to hear how how those first seeds have sort of been planted and, and really seem to have taken root at Southampton and now sort of flourishing throughout throughout the whole club. Um, I think it would be of interest then to see sort of how how those seeds were were planted within yourselves as as individuals. Um, I, I suppose probably Keith, you may be the first one. If we go kind of chronologically, and I believe that sort of the, this journey probably you began with you first. So uh, in terms of some of the, the techniques and, and sort of the understanding around mindfulness, how how did you how did you come to that? How did you come to take it on board and actually believe that? Wow, this is something that has some some value for me as an individual. And also as a as a as a performance tool. Yeah, I mean, my my coming to mindfulness was really fortuitous. I I was in graduate school, um, and for folks who went to my graduate school, a big rite of passage, something you were terrified of from day one, was taking this massive exam halfway through the program. Um, that that was just it has this this all day long testing component and you wrote this massive paper that went with it and you never knew what kind of question you were going to get to have to answer this paper and and i actually got a question on mindfulness and at that point i had never heard of mindfulness so this was like in 2003 2004 like in in that in that range i i maybe i'd heard the term but knew almost nothing about it and and had to do a ton of research on it for this paper and I guess I did a good job because my advisors at the time, one of whom was Carol Glass, who is now my partner, one of my partners in the MSP Institute, um, she knew I wanted to do my dissertation in sports psychology. And she said, well, we were kind of intrigued by what you said in, in this paper. What would you think about the idea of figuring out applications for mindfulness in sport? Um, and it sounded kind of interesting. And, and what was crazy is we started looking, started doing a literature review as we, as we began to design this dissertation study I was going to do. And there was almost nothing. There was almost nothing that had been done in mindfulness and sport. And it really felt like there was an opportunity here to, to really move the science forward in sports psychology in a different direction. And the more I learned about mindfulness, like I shared on that first slide, the more it just seemed like a no brainer that at least theoretically, the kinds of skills that, that we're training in mindfulness seem like they just fit with the kind of mindset that we, we know about goes with optimal performance. Um, and, and so one of the few things that did exist in, in the mindfulness literature in sport was this obscure poster that had been done by John Kabat-Zinn in the, in the 80s, where he had presented this at an international sports psychology conference, never wrote it up as a study, but it was this, this um, this work that he had done with rowers, with Olympic and collegiate rowers up in the Boston area in, in the States. 
um, and and had some really interesting findings. I, I and and so we were able to get in touch with John Kabat-Zinn and say, hey, can you share some of what what this was with us? We're we're curious about developing an intervention, and and he really wowed us. He said, oh yeah, you know, at, at the time he was already a pretty big name in the mindfulness world. Um, and he said, you know, we, we had this foray into sport, but I never did anything with it, but here you go. He, here was our idea and, and, you know, do what you want with it essentially. Um, and, and so he, he sent, he actually retyped the poster that had been done because it had been done like before the internet was, was anything. And before there was really even a, like, we couldn't email things or, or send things electronically. So we had to retype it because it was literally a paper poster that had been done. Um, and sent it over to us, and it was just awesome. And, and so it got our gears turning about, well, how do we take what he's done with mindfulness-based stress reduction and, and kind of advance that a little further? And, and we felt like the missing link, what wasn't there was this integration into action, right? The chaos of sport, being able to, it's, it's one thing to sit down in a quiet room and, and meditate. It's another thing to be able to maintain this, this open, non-judgmental present style of attention while everything is happening around you and everyone's yelling at you or you know you're constantly reacting to good things bad things that are happening and so we wanted to develop a program that would take that next leap and so that's that's what became mspe where again it, it started off the curriculum of mspe with these sedentary practices but gradually we increased uh the applicability and the integration into the sport of focus um, and, and so now we've got, so I think we first published an, a manual in MSPE in 2005. Um, and so we've got almost 20 years, crazy to say this, almost 20 years worth of research now on this program and, and what, became, what began as a dissertation and then became a program of research through Catholic University where I graduated from and then continued to work after I got my degree. Um, has now grown into this MSPE Institute that we've started and now does consultation on a global level. Um, and we get to talk to amazing people like Amy and Alex about how they're, they're integrating this stuff. So that's, that is again, sort of condensing 20 years worth of history into a very succinct story, but that's kind of where I began. All right, fantastic stuff. Uh, I'm gonna take that on to, to Amy. Uh, I think Amy has a interesting story that well, she's related to us how, how what a great job she's done at Southampton and getting everyone to buy into this idea of mindfulness. But yourself was a little bit, you were a little bit skeptical <laughs> about it when you first began your PhD, I believe. Uh, yeah. yeah, correct. Um, I was very skeptical. Um, it was actually my head of department from psychology. He, he mentioned mindfulness and said, Amy, I think you need to have a look into this. Um, so I went on an, an eight week mindfulness course. And I have to be honest, the first four weeks, I absolutely hated it. I thought, what is this? Um, it's airy, it's fairy. I don't understand how any of this links. Um, in, the, in the body scan, I completely fell asleep within five minutes. Um, so yeah, it just was not for me. And then I, had, I got asked to do a speech in front of my old secondary school. And that is my biggest fear, speaking in front of lots of people. Um, so there's about 400 people, spotlight on me. And every time I just started going um, uh, um, during my speech and it was absolutely terrible. And then all of a sudden I stopped and just said in front of everyone, I'm extremely nervous. And as soon as I accepted that I was extremely nervous, the rest of my speech went absolutely fine. I was in flow. Um, and I think at that point, that was the eureka moment for me that going actually why am I trying to fight all of these things? Why can't I just accept it? And I can then, if I accept it, I can carry on with what I'm actually meant to be doing. And that completely changed my outlook on mindfulness, hence me now doing a PhD in mindfulness. Um, but yeah, initially it, it wasn't smooth sailing. <laughs> but yeah, that's my story. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you have that eureka moment and there's no doubt that that it's going to be a huge advantage for you in terms of what you're doing now in 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 sort of presenting mindfulness at, at Southampton. But you sort of mentioned that yeah, falling falling asleep, sort of with the breathing techniques. Is that did that eureka moment help with that also, or that's still again like we sort of mentioned, there's still that struggle uh, before the before the release. There is definitely still that struggle. Um, I'd be lying if there wasn't. 
but I am more aware of when I catch myself. I can I can catch myself when I'm drifting off, or if I'm doing the body scan, for example, I can catch myself drifting off and recognize, oh no, let's bring myself back on task. And I'd be lying if some of the players haven't fallen asleep during my session, they because they have. But then I also turn around to the S and C and medical staff going, they obviously need that sleep. So I'm not going to disrupt them when they need that sleep. But ultimately we then reflect on why did they fall asleep? What made them drift off without being able to catch themselves? So all of these experiences for me are just learning. They you just as long as you can learn from them and understand what's happened and have that true reflection, I think all experiences can be beneficial. No, no, absolutely. Absolutely. If I can just piggyback on that real quick, because I, I love that. And I think that's that's part of what was so appealing to me about mindfulness, too, is that it is all about learning. And, and so often in sport, we think about things as success and failure, right and wrong, win and lost, right? And when you do a practice like this and you realize, oh, I fell asleep, it's like, okay, that was your experience this time. And, and, and not shaming somebody for it or not feeling like they failed at an exercise, but trying to understand, okay, well, this is what happened this time. Um, and, and it just, it, it models and it, and it grows this learning mindset. And, and when, I'll just say this real quick, I don't mean to hog the floor here again, but when, when I did a workshop mm -hmm. at Southampton with, with Amy's coaches, I, I remember we, we had this discussion on, on this sort of closed mindset, right? This sort of black and white win loss kind of thing. And, and how, like, how do you want your players to pay attention on the field, right? You want them to be open. You want them to, to be receptive to learning, to hearing what you're saying. You don't want them so in their head they're beating themselves up about a mistake that they made that they're not listening to what you, the coach, are now saying on the, on the, on the side. Um, and and how, how this is actually a way to practice that, how this is so different, the language, the, the experience, the way we practice it actually strengthens this ability to be open in a way that so many other aspects in sport kind of close us down. Um, so anyway, thank you for saying that, Amy, because I think it, it really relates too to this idea of a growth mindset. Um, and, and that's such a big part of achievement in education and, and being willing to learn. I know, absolutely. Um, it brings a, the point up nicely with what I was going to ask Alex is within his own learning. She's coming from a, Alex, you're coming from a slightly different background from a more of a coaching aspect rather than the psychologist aspect. Um, and I understand that you, you, you are looking at the kind of the conscious and subconscious side of things. Yeah, con consciousness is a, a huge topic. I would say sometimes I'm scared about it. And, um, no, I would say I, I've been always interested. Or I thought that we are far away from our uh, full potential as a human. You know, I think there are many information we are missing or many information we are perceiving, but we are not actually um, bringing to our experience. And, and as, I, as I said, as a coach, I was always looking for the athlete perspective, the social relationships, the communication, the leadership, like the emotions, how you can, um, the team dynamics, you know, how, how you can increase the team performance by having the same values, you know, everybody aligned to the values. And I was lucky to, to stop my, my football coach career and, and find uh, a research group, which is based on complex system and sport, which they understand um, life and science and phenomena from a holistic perspective. And, and I needed four years actually from my PhD to actually find that, find, find a to mindfulness and flow. As I was explaining before, the, before we start, I started with the body awareness, where we think that the, the athlete themselves are the main responsible of the injury prevention. And actually we are kind of much disconnected about, uh, with our bodies. But then I thought that body awareness was actually, uh, if we are looking for the holistic approach, body awareness actually is like separating body and mind. So we went to the self-awareness concept, but then I get lost in all the philosophical self, which actually is also like consciousness is a huge, huge, huge and difficult topic. And then I find the flow state, 
which actually I understood why I was addicted to, to football and why I am addicted to, to physical activity, sports, and different kinds of situations. Um, and from flow state, it, it's difficult also in the literature to understand the flow state, you know. Every flow is different in different activities, and I wanted to bring the values, I wanted to bring the emotions, and then magically I found a, I found a mindfulness framework which actually allowed me to stop because the BHD, the difficulty is that you are going far away, far away, far away. Mindfulness gives me structure. And magically, I found the MSP ebook, which gave me the final structure, you know, the key information. And, and I definitely believe um, that mindfulness can bring the principles not just for the performance, but for the well-being, not just for the athlete, but the entire structure of the club. Okay, brilliant. Now, there's a quick question here for you. Um, ap apologies, Keith. Uh, I may be sort of bringing up the opposition here, but, uh, but Alex, a question here from one of our attendees. Could you talk about the MSPE as an intervention and the MAC intervention I can kind of mainly like summarize the difference between the two. Me? From your perspective. Yes. And then I, I'm sure I, Keith, I, Keith can, then, can then jump in and, uh, but from your, from your approach. I, I, I've been reading much more about the MSPE and from the MSP, I like the dynamic they have, the adaptability they have and the key performance facilitators. I think that for the team sports, which I was looking at, it was better, it is better. Which I really like about the MAC approach is all the perspective about the values, in my opinion. So I think it's, it will be in my career when I finish my PhD and I can um, know more about it, it could be the, a nice combination about, about the both. Okay, Keith, I don't know whether, it, is, it, is it fair of me to ask you to, to jump in on that one? And, uh... Sure. Well, I, I will just say as a caveat too, what, one of the real blessings of doing this work over these years has been how collaborative everyone in the mindfulness and sport world is. So you are not bringing up the enemy. We love Frank Gardner and Zella Moore very much. We recently collaborated with them on an article and, and um, Amy Baltzell um, as well. So, so folks who have developed kind of the main leading interventions in, in mindfulness and sport, we, we talk all the time. So <laughs> yeah, I, I very much appreciate a question like this and we're not territorial. And, and I think, I mean, one way to answer the question is, look, we're, we're all after the same thing in a lot of ways. We just have different theories for how to go about it. So I think Alex did a good job of really hitting on that, that MSPE is very much an outgrowth of mindfulness-based stress reduction and John Kabat-Zinn's work, um, which, I think lends itself in terms of, you know, being kind of a parallel to physical training, right? That there are these structured, progressive exercises and that, you know, our, our sort of metaphor is we're building these mental muscles along the way. Um, MAC is more grounded in ACT theory. So Steve Hayes' work and, and goes much more into, as he was alluding to, to values um, and some of the, the concepts that they go into. And, there is, some, there is some fabulous work that has come out on, on MAC and, and act more broadly in sport. Um, so, uh, you know, I think, I think really the key difference is theoretical and, and what their basis is. But, but the similarity is, look, we're, we're basically all training present moment attention and emotion regulation in, in these competitive environments. Okay, great. Um, I mean, Amy, have you sort of integrated any sort of other approaches, brought any other things into your to your practice as well, or have you sort of stuck quite firmly to the MSPE uh, approach? Um, I've probably stuck more firmly to the MSPE. Um, our clinical psych, however, is trained in ACT, so it's quite nice that, like Keith alluded to, we've got the different um, theories coming together and, and working in alignment, so Again, I'm really fortunate in that aspect that our, our clinical psych is his mode of therapy is, is through ACT. So we can do a nice combination there. OK, um, I think we've got one uh, brilliant question here from Zubin Javeri uh, before we sort of move on to the, the topic of 
how we how you're getting that buy-in from the players and the staff. But uh, Zubin asks, in any activity, there are transient affordances that evolve and evolve constantly. Would you say that flow state be a state where the person has achieved a mastery over choosing the right affordances, which are competing versus each other, and creating that sort of an intelligent reflex that eventually over time require low cognitive load? Oh, Amy, Malcolm would love this question. <laughs> this is right up his alley. <laughs> she, she, Malcolm is is um, one of the, one of Amy's colleagues at Southampton. This is the stuff he eats alive. <laughs> he could talk for an hour about this. <laughs> yeah, I can go for it. Yeah, uh, go for it. Alex can speak uh, for Malcolm. Uh, uh, yeah, that's a good question. I was I, as I was explaining you at the beginning. In my opinion, flow state is the natural state. At least how I experienced when I was a kid playing football. If you see the kids playing football in the park or playing any sport, they are in flow state. They have no thoughts. They have not, nothing to worry about. They have not the coach telling what they have to do. They are just perceiving and acting. So I, go, I, I would not say that the flow state is the mastery of choosing perform, uh, between the affordances and so on. And I also, I don't think there is a right or wrong decision. You know what I mean? So you can be in the flow state. I, I think your decision-making is efficient and effective most of the time, but you can be in the flow state in team sport and, 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 and did the wrong pass. But in my, in my opinion, but then you, your brain learns quickly. Okay, I did the wrong pass because whatever. So the next pass and I'm more in tune with time, space, and so on. So, in summary, I don't think it's, it's a mastery. I think it's just the state where you are that present moment that you actually perceive the affordances in, in more tune or the current state. And, and the last thing, yeah, I think in flow state actually you are, you are um, about the resource, you are more efficient. Mentally, something that it's also explained in the MSP book, you know, how, how the resources in attention, in the memory working and so on, actually you get efficient in this process. Yeah, there's some really interesting research that we, um, that we cited in the book, talking about mindfulness as mental efficiency training and what happens in the brain and um, so, yeah, I, I agree with what Alex is saying. Um, I, I think it's, at least from a mindfulness perspective, it's, it's a part of what comes with paying this style of attention. Um, and, and so, yeah, I, I think it was well said. I agree with what he said. But there is, if you're interested in reading more about that, there, there is a lot um, that, that's come out, like in the cognitive literature on, um, on what happens when, when people are trained this way, um, and about that kind of decision making in sport, it's it's fascinating stuff. Um, Amy, I'm 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 blocking on the term right now, and I'm going to kick myself. But when I mentioned Malcolm, he he talks about this all the time. What what is the? Do you recall the term? Uh, it's it's escaping me at the moment. Um, that kind of um, the 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 choosing, right? The sort of the auto, It's not really automatic. Like the thought here is like, and, and Alex, if you know what I'm getting at too, but. Um, you know, that, that by, by, by being plugged in to by being present, your body kind of knows what to do and making the correct response. Um, yeah. uh, well, it, this is related with intuition that this one, one, one right. concept, one concept I was looking at it, but it's very difficult that actually, yeah, it's this is kind of, um, a sense that your body, your mind knows. I think it's a, a beautiful book that it's the inner game of tennis that actually explains really, really well what he, what uh, the author called the self one and the self two and how the self two is trying to manage the self one at the end. No? But our body knows how to do different uh, the things, you know, and there is kind of a flowing of energy and thoughts and consciousness that is choosing the right, the right um, decision not the mind most of the time, but there is no, no, not uh, time space 
in football we see it all the time you know that that decision didn't come from the mind it's like that that mind mind body connection of the dots the the term i was reaching embodied cognition that's what i was trying to think of embodied cognition there there is some fascinating um, writing on embodied cognition, which I think relates to this question and what Alex is getting at as well. But I yeah, love the awesome. inner game of tennis as well. That's a great reference. That's great, guys. Um, I was going to bring Amy in. There's a question here directed at you from Matthew Cullen. Um, it kind of moves us into that realm of getting the, the buy-in from staff and players. And very direct to the point, how did you get the buy-in from the academy manager, the head coach to be open to MSPE? Uh, great question. I was, again, really fortunate. The, where I've been at Southampton for eight years, um, every week, all, all, the, all the players, all the teams have um, a, session of, uh, a session of psychology every week. So we, what we did is we pitched the idea to the academy director, um, and also the academy manager and said, look, this is the outcome that we're, we're looking to get to. We also, again, um, I looked at embedding mindfulness and did a, a whole session with our 400 staff at the club um, of kind of what is mindfulness, how it can be effective, how it can look at well-being and not only just performance. And then also um, I got the parents of the under 16s where we did the 10 week programme and showed them what we were looking to do as well. So we were tapping into all different um, if different areas, really looking at from a management point of view, a club perspective, and also the parental side. Um, and I think from that point, because we had so much investment and I suppose buy-in um, and willing willingness to do it from all the different staff. Again, I was very fortunate that. I was allowed to do it and it's just kind of carried on people the coaches saw the benefits of of what this what mspe could do um not only from a performance side so out on the pitch but also from a well-being perspective in terms of gcses so the under 16s were going through their gcses at that point the teachers and the educational staff or saw a difference of them being able to manage pressure pressure so it kind of ticked all the boxes i suppose I hope that answers your question, Matt. Uh, yes, and I think it brings us on nicely to, to a question from Mary Carmen Al um, I don't know whether Keith or Alex want to jump in on this one, but how do you get athletes to value mindfulness? So no, Amy's touched on it a little bit there, but where do you start with that? Um, I'll just I'll just say quickly. Um, I mean again, as I said in my, in my presentation earlier, we try to be very realistic that this is something that requires a unique level of commitment that not everyone historically has been willing to make. Um, and so we actually, in the MSP curriculum, we include uh, the whole beginning portion, the first part of the first session is talking about building a rationale for why this is something to invest in, right? And, and we encourage people who lead MSPE trainings to be very sport specific, to be very group specific, to try to speak to, you know, okay, this, this is what this training is designed to help you with. And, and, but this is the kind of practice that is required to really kind of see the, the changes that you might want to experience. Um, so I think being able to make it clear to athletes or whoever is participating in, in a training like MSPE up front that, that, you know, there are a lot of great things that can come from this. And we do talk about things like flow up front that that you know flow is a desirable state and and if you if you make time to do these kinds of practices you may see some changes in terms of your capacity to get into flow um, so so trying to make that connection is is i think really important and literally the first thing that we do in the MSP training and alex with jump... the, the athletes yes of course jump in sorry eh? i was just going to jump in and say for me to get the players to buy into it was very much getting the staff when the staff kind of utilized the language that they like we were using and showing the impact that it could have on performance and not only in the i suppose the formal sessions that we were delivering um on our intervention 
with MSPE, but the coach is also then taking it out from what they've experienced and then bringing that out onto the pitch and getting the coaches to then talk about it. For me, that was where I suppose the biggest impact was that you had all the staff saying exactly the same thing. And so you were triangulating your information across everyone rather than just one message coming across from me. And I think if I was to do it again, um, if like you embed it into a new team that haven't had uh, MSPE or any, any form of mindfulness, um, my place would start would be getting the staff on board to then kind of reiterate that message to the players. Yeah, I think that's that's a great point. And, and I think, you know, even walking it back a step, like I was saying, like in session one, this is one of the things we tackle head on, but we've run groups where the coaches have basically said, okay, here's my team, I'm out of here, right? And, and so we're gonna go off and, and do something else while you work with the team. That, that tends to not work very well for something like this. And so I think what Amy's saying is getting the stakeholders um, on board and, and helping them to understand what this is and, and hopefully having them being present as part of the training or definitely learning the language, right? Because if, if you're trying to train the team to act one way and then the coach has no idea what you're doing and comes in and does the exact opposite, it can be very confusing and turn, turn the players off, obviously. So I think getting everyone pulling in the same direction and, and I think something else Amy did really well, she mentioned this before, is talking to parents as well if you're working with younger kids. So coaches, other staff, parents, whoever the stakeholders are with, with the athletes and helping them to understand, I think that's, that's really helpful to getting buy-in. Yeah, I was also going to ask Alex, um, in terms of the athletes that you've worked with, um, yeah, how did you find that buy-in? But then I also know that, um, as you mentioned before to us, that uh, you, you really believe that, that it's that buy-in really needs to come from the coaching staff from the heads of department without that what whatever work you do with the players is is not really going to have that much traction if you don't have the buy-in from the coaching staff yeah I, th I think that the the whole project you know but at the end even i think that that uh, in order to have sustainability the project it must come from 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 top the top directors and the coordinators and the coach and so on. Actually, the club will manage it or will will buy in if they see results, and the player the player also will buy it if they see results. So I think the best thing to do, to talk to the player is about performance. You know, I can talk here about well being and so on, but they don't they don't really care because they cannot think that lot there. So we talk about performance. But I also use the mental paradox because I think it's real and, 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 and all these kids, youth, every player can, can know that, okay, which is the main thing it's going to actually uh, make the difference. Or you see in professional football, in professional sports, the big difference, where is it? In the mental, in the mental part. So actually, okay, so if you want to be, not just to get in, in the first team, for example, or first division, just to be able to sustain this level, what you will need. And from there, you can just manage it. Okay, so mindfulness can help to self-regulate your emotions. Mindfulness can help you to have the good habits. Mindfulness can help to deal with pressure. And all of these, you can just, they can get the structure and say, okay. I also use the athletes to like reference, you know? that I know they have this kind of uh, attitude and so on to where they can look at. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's um, a good point there, how you are getting the feedback from the players and, and certainly with uh, at Southampton, you're working from a, a very wide range of, of players from different cultural backgrounds and, and, and more pointedly probably ages as well I imagine working if you're working also with pre-academy at that very young infant age is going to be very different to working with the with the senior players oh yeah definitely I mean you've got to know your athlete or know your player in front of you before you go in and do anything so the language that I would use with a nine-year-old would be completely different with a 23-year-old um, and the way that you approach it would be completely different as well 
I think, again, one of the benefits, because all of the staff are really on board and because the staff are open, utilising them is fantastic. Really getting them to know, well, I suppose experience it as well. So coaching CPDs, the, the, the coaches will have um, psych CPDs probably four times a year. Um, and the last one that we've just done was actually on flow and how you can embed flow or uh, what, what flow state looks like, but also how you embed mindfulness from a coaching perspective from an under nine year old all the way through. We just looked at the to the 23s on this particular occasion um, and how coaches can change their language, looking at the like what Alex said before about the, the challenge versus skill and, and, and really looking at all of the coaching constraints. Um, so I think depending on who you've got in front of you would be how you would uh, change your approach, particularly with the younger age groups, we get the teachers involved as well. So I've been on a course called Dot B, which is where you look at changing the language for nine, I think it's nine to 16 year olds um, and the different approaches that they would use for how to embed it into a classroom setting. So that's really great that we can then take some of that concept and put it across to the teachers and also the, the coaching staff um, and the support staff and get them to utilize that language, which would be completely different to an under 23. I don't know whether I've answered that question or not, if I'm just rambling, I'm afraid. <laughs> oh, you're on mute, Steve. Yes, I know. I think you answered it and, and a bit more um, and answered it in a way that sort of, yeah, has made me swerve to a, a different question um, from, from Jean-Michel, apologies to Jean-Michel Chacon Nicolau. I hope I've uh, got somewhere close to pronouncing that right. Um, but uh, the question is that the work of motor assertive communication can be related and also improve to the work of mindfulness. I think, yeah, the question there, yeah, sort of the work of, uh, or should I say, the use of motor assertive communication relates and, and improves the, the, the work of mindfulness. I don't know whether, Amy, would you want to continue on, on that one, uh, sort of speaking about communication? Yeah. Um, in terms of, well, in terms of the communication, again, I'm going to go back to the dot B. So the dot B really, it, it's lovely the way that they illustrate kind of the way that you can be, the, the way that you can bring across mindfulness. Um, and in terms of communication, for me, it doesn't just have to be verbal. So one of the aspects that I really like about dot B and, and Headspace, Headspace do it really nicely, is the animations and getting people to understand what mindfulness is through anim animations and how how you can relate to it. And, and one thing that really stands out from dot B is the puppy mind. And explaining that to a nine-year-old, they really understand that the mind is like a puppy. You've got to train the puppy to come back. The, the puppy wants to wander off all the time and wants to do its own thing. And it's exactly the same with a nine-year-old's kind of mind. Well, the same with, with my mind, the, the mind wants to wander, but you've got to train yourself to bring it back again. And I think if I had said that to a nine-year-old, they might not understand it but if I can show that animation it has that kind of nice twig that it's that eureka moment that I was talking about that they can understand oh actually my mind will do that but I've also I can choose to bring it back again and I think that's really powerful. But... One of the quotes that I love about and I, I, I apologize I don't remember who said it um, but, but the idea of mindfulness training is helping you to understand how the mind works and helping you to be able to work with the mind. And, and so I, I love that. And, I, and going back to one of those quotes that I shared from, from Peter Haberl, how the idea here is, is, you know, everyone's mind works like a puppy, right? Everyone's mind, like you heard other, lots of other analogies, like a stampeding elephant or monkey mind, like there's all these different a lot of animal, I guess, analogies to how the mind likes to bounce around and go to lots of different places. And, um, and again, I can't overstate how often I will work with an athlete or with a team and, and the goal, the stated goal that they have is to stop thinking, is to stop that sort of puppyish nature of, of the mind and, and how 
that may not be a realistic goal. That's just not how the human mind works. And so I totally agree with what Amy is saying. I think that the language that you use, how you introduce it, how you incorporate it can look very different across different age groups or different sports, different competitive levels. Um, but um, this, this idea of just helping people to understand how the human mind works and that there are these tangible practices that we can do, right? And that's where you go into like the, neuro, the neuroimaging research and what, what people are showing happens when we practice mindfulness regularly, how the brain changes. Um, you know, that it's really exciting stuff. And, and for that reason, I, I like, you know, Amy, you were saying in the beginning how when you first came to mindfulness, it seems so fluffy and fairy, I think was one of the words that you used and, and how when you actually get into the science of mindfulness, it's actually one of the more concrete practices that we have in sports psychology, right? Like if you look at a lot of the classic um, psychological skills training, cognitive behavioral therapy kinds of interventions, at least to me, it's much less clear what the practice effects are, like what's actually changing by doing this stuff. And, and something that's so exciting about mindfulness and help, helping people to understand more about their minds and how they work is that, you know, we're, we're actually able to present this in a way that athletes can digest. Like this is like physical training, right? If we think about our mind like a muscle, we're training this muscle to get stronger so we can bring the puppy back, right? I mean, that, that's really what this is. Um, so I know I'm going off in a slightly different direction than what she was saying, but I mean, that, that to me is why this is such an exciting field, mindfulness and sport is. I think, I think theoretically it aligns, but also there's ways to present this no matter what age group you're working on that makes this really intangible out there kind of idea of attention and makes it real and practicable and quantifiable in, in this very cool way. I um, mean, yeah, I think uh, yeah. Before we we delve a little bit deeper into into the science of of, of mindfulness and the research that's been going on out there, there's just a question here from Peter Connolly. I think which refers back to one of the points you made in in your presentation, Keith. Um, that is, how do you avoid parachuting in if you do not work full time with a club, e.g., as a, an external consultant? Uh, what would be your approach with a new club or organisation? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and for someone like me, who is usually an outsider, right, who's brought in as a consultant, um, you know, I, I think it's a very different position than being like someone like Amy, who's embedded within a system. So um, I think if you're coming in as an outsider, I will quote my, my colleague, Tim Pinot, and saying it's really important to know when to say no, right, to, to recognize if someone is asking you to parachute in, and you know that you can't do an intervention like MSPE in a way that's going to be successful. Just being able to provide some gentle education about that, that, you know, that these conditions are not optimal. And I, and I think, you know, when, when, when the conditions are right, being able to provide that information up front that like, okay, MSPE is designed as a six session around 60 to 90 minute blocks per session. If someone says, I want MSPE and I'm going to give you, you know, 20 minute, you know, three 20 minute sessions, that's not going to work. So, so let me tell you, okay, this, this is sort of what I need, but, but here's where the flexibility comes in, right? Like Amy was saying, it wasn't realistic at Southampton to do six 90 minute sessions, but I could have the athletes for 30 to 40 minutes. And so if I could have the athletes for 30 to 40 minutes, here's how I could work with you to craft what is still legitimately MSPE, right? Like I don't wanna sort of break the intervention and say, oh, you know, there, there's an integrity to the system that's important, um, but, but how can I work with you to try to take our program and make it work within your system, right? I, I think that is a really crucial element to this. Um, so kind of knowing how you can customize it, how you can bend it to contort it, to make it fit without it breaking and, and it, there's no way it's gonna be effective. I think that's a crucial distinction. Uh, great stuff. Um, Alex, I don't know if you wanted to jump in on that um, at all uh, in terms of what your approaches would be to, to sort of implementing your ideas at a club. Yeah, I was, I was thinking the same now, you know, because you see the literature and you see a six weeks, eight weeks, 10 weeks program, but the, the, and you can, I think you can change the mind and you can really actually uh, impact as you can see with the fame profile that they use in the MSP. So you actually, you can have an impact for, for six, eight weeks. But 
the key is to be sustainable in time, you know, is to integrate maybe 30 minutes, 40 minutes weekly. It's not just the, the six sessions. I mean, the, the MSPE, they did a great job trying to put all the information there, but you can work any of the key performance facilitators along the way, you know, and give time to the athletes to express themselves. What do they actually need? You know, how do they feel? You know, you can work in different things every week and, and, and look at the perspective from the mindfulness per perspective, you know, and help them to understand that this is not done in six or eight or 10 weeks, even though it's with what we are doing. No, no luckily, uh, not Amy in, in Southampton. What I have to say that I think they are the first, at least what I've been looking, the first football club that actually they are doing this sustainable. I think Arsenal, uh, it's also using Headspace. So I think many, many clubs are, are buying into the mindfulness. But MSPE, it needs to be applied in the structure of the club and not just the players, the coaches, the parents. That's how it should be done, in my opinion. I'm just going to expand on that. I mean, just going off from what Alex said, like you, you, you do see a lot of programs that are six, 10, 12 weeks, whatever they are. Um, and I think one one really nice thing is getting, like if you're working, say for an example, uh, injured player who's got an ACL, nine months, nine months rehab, being able to kind of, even if we're taking the MSPE, because of how flexible it is, it's kind of bringing it into all stages of their rehab. It doesn't have to be just done within six sessions. It can be kind of put along the whole, the whole way. And Alex, correct me if I'm wrong, but from what Alex was saying is that you can then take the individual that you're working with and then go at their speed as well. So it doesn't just have to be condensed into those six sessions or those 10 sessions or those 12 sessions. You can elongate it into the nine months, which then starts to embed it into them. They're starting to practice it, but it's all because you're catering towards that individual. So it's a little bit harder when it's with a team, but with that individual, you can kind of dip in and dip out and going to go, right, this is what we're, we're going to, look at this particular aspect and we're going to carry this on for a number of weeks because you really bought into that and you were struggling with that aspect so let's refocus on that aspect and kind of do it that way yeah and and, and here i will i would like to add for me the key is to integrate the habit of meditate you know 10 minutes every day 15 minutes every day this is the habit they have that they can you know integrate which i have to say that um the players I've been working to, they really like the body scan, which I, when I did the MSVR, I'm not a really fan of the body scan, but they actually like. I prefer to meditate in the morning. They actually prefer to do it the last time. So you learn a lot from the players. But it's not, you know, one hour session a week. It's just to integrate to the habit, to how they live, how they think, how they train, how they eat, everything. Yeah, and just to piggyback off, off what both you guys are saying, um, I mean, that's for MSPE has these sort of informal elements and these formal elements. And I, I was sort of talking about that in the beginning that, you know, talking about how players eat or how they walk or, or how they attend a meeting or how they show up on the, I mean, there's, there's endless opportunities to be present, to, to bring a meditative kind of mindset to, to what you're doing. But I think it's also important to set aside that special time to actually do the practice, right? And that's where the formal stuff comes in. And, you know, you guys can speak to your experience. I know from my experience, it's the formal stuff that is the hardest to sell, right? The informal stuff, not that it's easy, but it's just more, it's like, oh, I can do this while I'm, you know, walking to my meeting, as opposed to I need to take 10 or 15 or 20 minutes and, and sit down and do this kind of practice. And, and so I think, again, you know, part of the tension that we're always navigating is, how do we flex this? How do we make MSPE adaptable in a way so it's still MSPE, but so that it, people are getting the, the necessary practice? And, I, and I'll, again, I, I, Amy had this on her slide, but I know we went over it quickly in the beginning. You know, one of the real ingenious things I think she did and the club did, like one of the things that we do in MSPE, one of the, the first times we introduce movement-based practice is we do some gentle yoga exercises. And, and so Amy brought that into the strength and conditioning um, work that was being done at the club. So it kind of circumvents this lack of time argument, right? If, 
if you're bringing the formal practice into an already scheduled activity, something that they're already doing, and, and the, coach, the coaches who are involved can speak the language or will give you as the, you know, the sports psychologist the access to be able to go in there and like co-lead. Um, I mean, that is a wonderful way to try to thread this needle. It's like, hey, we're doing the MSBE practice, we're doing the formal exercises, but we're doing it in an activity that the players were already scheduled to do, right? And, and something they already see a lot of value in. Um, so I thought that was a really key adaptation that she made with the club is saying, okay, it might be hard to find half an hour, 40 minutes, whatever to do yoga, but we've got this strength and conditioning session and we can basically practice the same, the same thing that we're after. Um, yeah, while uh, I have you, uh, Keith, uh, there's a question here from Sargal, which uh, we sort of kick off the, the discussion around around the impact that uh, the mindfulness is having on 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 player performance. Um, and here, Sargal is specifically asking, can you share your insights and possibly with yourself a bit of research as well about the influence of mindfulness on athletes' emotional state? Yeah, I mean, we, we've done a lot of research at this point and, and we've seen, we have seen some, some relationships between MSPE and, and flow factors like we've talked about. We've seen some relationships with things like confidence and anxiety um, moving in, in, the, in the desirable directions. Um, and, and with performance as well, I, I think one of the, re and, and I'll be honest about where the research is, I think in sports psychology in general, and with mindfulness specifically, it is very hard to do adequately controlled research to be able to draw firm conclusions that are beyond like correlations. Um, and, and we're always, we're constantly trying to innovate and find, we've done some, um, some controlled studies, but, but I think as, as a science, it's still very young. And so I don't want to overstate the results. Um, but some of the most exciting findings that we have, I think, again, as, as a testament to like what, what Amy's doing, um, are with teams that we've consulted with over a period of time and seeing how their, their team culture has evolved and their performance has evolved. Um, if, if you're a listener to, to our podcast, uh, our Mindful Sport Performance podcast, we, we've had a couple of members of this team on in the past, but there's like a lacrosse team here in the DC area that we've worked with for years um, and, and to see how they went from a, a, a very losing program, let's say, to, to a repeated championship winner now. And, and we can't attribute it all to MSP. We're not saying that that's the only thing that changed, um, but it was a big shift. Um, and, and their coach really bought in. Their coach really made the space. And, and Tim, my colleague in particular, has worked with them. And so we've seen the kinds of performance changes that can occur when you're, when you're given that kind of access, when someone really does give this a fair shake um, that we've seen pretty consistently. And, and of course, beyond MSPE, there's lots of um, you know, professional sport examples from, from the work that Phil Jackson did in the NBA with, with the Bulls and the Lakers and the Seattle Seahawks and, and what Michael Gervais has done with them um, and the success that they've had. So we're now just waiting for Southampton to win the Premier League and, and that will um, you know, further validate uh, the performance benefits of, of this kind of thing. Um, but, but if you're listening to this and you are a scientist or you're a student who, who is interested in doing research, you know, we, we, we got the ball rolling, but we want people to take this and run with it. And I think a lot more is needed to be able to really pin down what are the key benefits of a program like MSPE? What, what is really changing with performance? Um, because as we said, I mean, it's just, it is very hard to do methodologically sound um, sort of field valid, um, controlled research in sport and, and mindfulness. Uh, yeah, Amy, I think there's a, there was a cue in there for you as well, uh, a, a couple of times on, on the work going on at Southampton and yeah, what, are, what have you seen through, through your program? What, are, what have been the sort of standout insights for you? <laughs> Thanks, Keith. Um, I, I was actually while you were talking, I was reflecting on actually how the how the coaching staff have really seen some of the benefits, and that's actually through the analysis. So kind of their behavioural reactions of players, and then seeing it after kind of a period of really focusing on mindfulness and really paying attention to um, all these different aspects, and then seeing their behavioural outcomes afterwards. 
So after a, a prolonged period, so for example, if a player has got an individual development plan and that is specifically working with uh, the psychologist around emotional control um, or emotional regulation around kind of their behavior patterns and how they're decision making and the approach that we take is through MSPE or through mindfulness and then kind of uh, looking at it after that particular kind of period block of period that we've done with them it's really nice to utilize the resources that we've got around us and the analysis department can be an absolutely fantastic way to showcase that not only for the coaches but for the players as well and again I'm not saying that what we do is the only thing that is kind of having an impact but it's nice to show a before and after and especially within sport I think having that that view in front of you where you can physically see a change and a difference is, is really impactful and it goes back to what we started around the buy-in it can really help with that buy-in for players as well to go oh well hang on a minute like I've seen this is what I was like and it took me I don't know five minutes to get back into position and to really pay attention to actually me shortening that and going the coaches have seen a difference my match grades have gone up all of these different things are happening so being able to correlate all those different um, performance indicators within what you have, what resources you have around you, I think it's really impactful. And Alex, uh, feel free to to jump in and add on what Alex, on what uh, Amy and Keith have just mentioned. But I've also got a, a question here for you as well from Harry Varley, which is: uh, Is mindfulness used as training to develop intuition, or is intuition already there and just needs to be accessed? Uh... Yeah, quickly this question. I think intuition is already there, and we need to just uh, uh, tune the attention, you no, know, to the proper information. But both questions are, are are right. You know what I mean? Intuition is already there, but mindfulness help us to access this information. And about the the impact on performance, actually, it's one of the, the biggest challenges football for example you know there are many 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 variables actually how can you measure performance you know what how, how many goals do you score it has no sense how many uh which percentage of right passes do you have it's many 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 things and i, I know the quantitative quantitative data is so important in, in science but i'm also looking for a qualitative data you know what what the what the athlete is feeling how they how they feel about, about themselves, how they, you know, in the field and out the field. You know, I think coaches' opinion are really important. You know, how you have seen this player evolve in this in this area. So, of course, I really like Amy's perspective of many, which kind of data we can have about this. And nowadays we have many, 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 many data which, where we could be looking at. But I think qualitative, um, Analysis must be take, taken into consideration as well. I think with what Alex was saying also, one of the things we notice often in MSPE trainings is that people start seeing benefits even outside of their sport first. Like he was talking earlier about, you know, we emphasize the performance aspects, but really there's a lot of well-being that gets worked into this, right? This is not just about performance. This, this is a way of being, this is a way of life mindfulness. And, and so, you know, we're trying to, we're, we're trying to obviously help people do better on the field, but ultimately we want them to feel better too. We want them to like playing their sport more. We want them to communicate better. We want them to feel there's more richness in their lives and, and that is in their sport, but also outside. And, and so I think oftentimes one of the real nice things about this is even though it's billed as a performance enhancement kind of training is you start to see benefits outside of even just sport, which actually then help with sport performance, right? So for example, you know, sometimes people will say to us that they're sleeping better or they're eating better or their relationships are going better. And, and so they're less stressed and they're more present you know, on the field, that, that there can be all these ancillary kinds of benefits because at its heart, this is a well-being training, right? That, that is a big part of what we're after. It's, it's, I think the word was used earlier, it's holistic. Um, we're trying to treat the the whole person and train the whole person in this. And, and so 
I, I totally agree with what Alex is saying. It's very hard to quantify this into familiar performance terms. Like, you know, X got better and, and that means this works and that's it, right? This, this is so much more complex and, and I think at least beautiful than that, right? It, it extends across so many different parts of our lives. Uh, I'm going to throw out a question uh, here from John McKell. Um, he mentions sort of in, in the clubs, have you planned in weekly microcycles tools and tasks to improve social effective spaces, ecological perception and cognition to go to a comprehensive model of training? Um, and do you work assertive communication and feedback models to improve improve mindfulness with coaches, with the coaching staff. So I don't know whether, sort of Amy, that might be uh, maybe easier for you to jump straight in on that one, if, if possible, um, to see whether yeah, these weekly microcycle tools are, are something that you're, you're using at the club. Yeah, I was just trying to trying to find the question so I could read it as well, because <laughs> that was a very long question. <laughs> very long question, yeah. Um, it's at the top of the, the Q&A list on mine from Jean-Michel Chachon Nicolau. Well, I mean, Steve, I might uh, just try and answer the question and then you, if I don't answer all of it, then you can jump in. <laughs> yeah. um, in terms of the micro cycles, we, we actually don't just look at mindfulness. So as a club from a psychology department point of view, um, our overall aim, and again, we've tried to embed this across all of the different disciplines from a coaching perspective through to the medical, that what is the performance question? Well, the performance question, we want to achieve optimal performance. That's from a coaching perspective, from a psych, from a medical, anything. So in order to do that, we want to look at three different constructs. And again, this is just the way that we do it. it it's not set in stone but we want to look at flow, resilience, and cohesion. So there are three, are three kind of constructs that we want to look at. So in terms of um, like our meso and micro cycles, we, we kind of break it down into those three. Like what do we want to look at? So for example, at pre-season, we really focus on the cohesion. And it's not saying that we don't look at the resilience, we don't look at the flow, because all of them are interlinked, but actually, our full focus is going to be on that. And so from a coaching perspective, can they in pre-season look at cohesion? From a medical perspective, how do they enhance that cohesion within pre-activation or within recovery? From an SNC perspective, how do they enhance that cohesion in pre-season through some of their SNC drills out on the pitch? So we're trying to kind of embed that all the way across the club that it's not just, we're not just looking at being mindful, we're not just looking at being in flow all the time, we're looking at these other things. So in terms of breaking it down into the meso macro cycles and everything like that, that's kind of how, we, how we're how we addressing it. Has that answered the question? Please, anyone else jump in and help me. <laughs> no takers, so they're leaving you out to, <laughs> hanging you out to dry there, Amy. Though I think you, 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 I think you gave a really good answer to that question there. There was a lot of, Good detail in there. Um, I would ask the sort of just in general feedback models. Um, I don't know, about Alex, um, your thoughts in terms of your sort of trying to monitor your players and and actually what sort of impact your your programs are having. Uh, how how are you monitoring that? Where does sort of the feedback from the players? How how are you doing that? Um, I'm actually using the the, the questionnaires, quantitative quantitative data. And I took the fame profile that they are using in the MSPE, which means flow, anxiety, uh, mindfulness, and emotional regulation. I always look at a questionnaire that I developed myself on part of the, of the thesis that actually is trying to, to look of the thought, uh, the feeling, and the action. Is it what we think about this kind of information, what we actually feel and what we're, how we actually act upon this information. And, and finally, I'm gonna do a focus groups, trying to, you know, to know, to have a qualitative analysis, how they think about it, how they think they can improve, what they really value of the, of the program and, and so on. 
Yeah, thanks. I, I think it could be good to manage if I could, for example, uh, do the, the study in, in, in a big lab, you know, I could think it would be good to manage the stress uh, response more gradually, you know, uh, get access to the performance parameters with we could actually uh, correlate and so on. And Keith, feel free to add add to that. Though I do have a have a, a different question for you as well, um, and that is, um, can you mentally prepare yourself a day before a game through imagining or daydreaming certain movement skills, game situations, or to enhance your performance? Um, and I guess there, with this question, we're kind of looking at the two kind of core different approaches around psychology within within sport. This kind of idea of sort of having these mental visions of performance and then the kind of men the mindfulness that you're sort of introducing into the arena yeah so i, I think that's exactly right steve i, I think um you, you know mindfulness is known as sort of like a third wave technique and it's an outgrowth of, of cognitive behavioral kinds of interventions which many of the traditional interventions in sports psychology are more of that second wave sort of traditional model and so visualization, mental rehearsal, those kinds of things, there's oodles of evidence to show that, that they can work really well. I, I don't know. I mean, I think daydreaming, I, I, I would stay away from daydreaming specific because I think like visualization is, is obviously a very controlled process. And when I think of daydreaming, I think of just sort of letting your mind wander off somewhere. So that's depending on how that was meant and the, that word was used in the question, I, I, I guess that, that would just be something I'd caution against. But um, but I think mindfulness, of course, is a little different than, than visualization or mental rehearsal. It does bring up, though, this really sort of interesting question that we get a lot in, in trainings that we do. And I know different people have different views on this, but, but whether mindfulness and sort of cognitive behavioral techniques, more traditional ones, if they can fit together or if they're completely opposed. In, in, I think, you know, they're underpinnings, right? So it's traditional cognitive behavioral approaches are all about sort of changing thoughts, right? Like, so for example, the classic, I've got negative thoughts, I'm going to change them into positive thoughts. You know, I'm going to visualize something positive. I'm going to visualize myself having success. Nothing wrong with that. But, but one of the main arguments that's come out for something like mindfulness and something we talk about a lot in our book are what are called ironic mental processes, which is when sometimes when we're trying to change a negative thought into a positive thought, we inadvertently start paying more attention to the negative thought, right? And telling ourselves, oh, I shouldn't be thinking this way. This is wrong, this is bad. And that gets us more stuck, right? Where mindfulness takes a very different approach is in saying, look, whatever I notice, whatever I'm thinking, whatever I'm feeling, it's okay. It is what it is. But I can also kind of create some distance from that, right? So, and there's lots of different terminology that's used for that process. And like John Kabat-Zinian is, is sort of like a decentering um, kind of process, or it's called diffusion in more act-based literature, which is this act, which is this practice of just creating a little bit of distance from a thought or a feeling you're having, recognizing that it's just a thought or a feeling, and you can let it go. You don't have to change it. You don't have to make it something else. You can just let it pass you by and, and refocus your attention on what you're doing. So there is kind of a fundamental difference in terms of how we're handling mental events in CBT versus mindfulness. But I think there are also some ways that these approaches can be complementary. So really quick example, um, like in MSPE, a lot of it is movement-based, but it, as Amy has referenced, sometimes you might be doing this with like an injured athlete. And so, you know, you might be able to do a mindfulness type practice through visualization, through a mental experiencing of, of an action, as opposed to actually doing it if you're injured and you're not able to do the action as you normally would. That, there are some ways that you could bring that, that sort of classic CBT approach into a mindfulness practice, at least I believe. I know there are some people who disagree with that, but that's, that's my, my feeling on it. I'm actually gonna jump in on that yeah. because I'm doing that at the moment. <laughs> so in terms of this particular player that I'm working with, he's coming back from injury um, and he has he's gone through kind of turmoil with his injury and everything like that and it's really showing him that he's not the he's not an injured player he's just a player that is injured and going from that transition from being an injured player to that transitioning of coming back out onto the pitch 
and being that fully fit player. And he he talks a lot about that anticipation of being back out with the team, wanting to have that enjoyment again and wanting all of that. So we've actually done a bit of visualization with him, but we've looked at that mindfulness has been the core throughout. And by that, I mean that we've gone out onto the pitch, he's worn his boots. So we've gone through the pet let model, model where we're physically in that environment, we're, we're paying attention to the emotions and everything. And what's really nice is when we're reflecting and feeding back that he's gone, Amy, I noticed when my head was going to my injury. I noticed when it was there, but I was being able to bring it back and then continue to visualize that I was fully fit. So it was a really nice combination that he notices when his mind's going off. So he's not trying to change that thought, like what normal, uh, what like PST would say. He's, he's just noticing that his mind has gone there and then he's being able to bring it back just by practicing those anchors, bring it back and then fully visualize where he is at this moment in time and seeing himself running out on that pitch again. So again, like, like what he's saying, the, there is com conflicts in the, in the literature and everything, but I think it depends on, on how you use it. And again, come back, coming back to what Alex said, it's about the individual that you've got in front of you. So I'm not gonna tell this particular player, no, we're not doing visualization. It's more if that works for him, right, well, let's utilize that and let's see if we can incorporate some of the other techniques alongside it to enhance that. Um, I'd add to that, Amy, um, but is that something you would use with the younger age groups? So no, say if you're, if you're getting players at six, seven, eight, nine, ten, they're sort of having a very different introduction to mindfulness than, say, players who are in their mid-twenties, early thirties, who probably have sort of been pretty, pretty used to having these visualisation techniques. But maybe the younger players who've not been introduced to that yet, is that something you would still use with them? Or you think, well, okay, we'll move away from that now. It's not really a benefit unless in a very specific situation like rehab. Again, I think it's got to be specific, uh, situation specific. So the particular example that I was just speaking about, this is an older player. So gone through the system, he under, he's kind of had psychology all the way through and, and everything like that. So if I was working with a nine-year-old, it would be a completely different kind of story that I'd be telling and again I would go back to I would really utilize the physio really utilize the physiotherapist because they're going to spend more contact time with the physio than they are with me at that particular age so why am I trying to embed something when actually the physio could 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 do it and would have a better greater success purely down to the fact of the relationship that they have got with that particular player Okay, brilliant. And hopefully that is partly, well, I think throughout the session, you've helped answer the question from Mina Stemfuller, uh, which is about, do you use a variety of pr practitioners at Southampton, where I think it's pretty clear that, that you, you do, and, and very successfully. Um, I'm sort of a, conscious that we're running away with, with time here, so I'm just going to quickly rattle through these last two questions. I'm going to throw the first one to Alex, um, and, and probably, Alex, if you can try and give a a very brief answer to a question that probably deserves a very long and, and detailed answer, but Mary Carmen asks, what happens when we are learning a new skill? I think this is probably a topic all on its own. Um, to what extent do we have to be aware of what we are doing? For example, if I'm learning to do a backflip and I focus on bringing my knees to my chest, I will not get this state of flow. So I guess when we're learning a new skill, how, you know, it's kind of, it seems like like internal focus versus that external focus, which may sort of allow you more to get into into flow. Yeah, this is a, a huge discussion also in the in the way of motor learning. I believe we learn the skill thinking about the objective. You know what I mean? When we when we learn to run a bicycle, for example, we think and just go go straight and have direction. We are not thinking how to move the knee, you know, the small details, biomechanics and so on. So I think mm, sports has become very specific in, in technique and biomechanics. And maybe some sports, they need to go that way. But in a learning skill, I believe also, I believe more to go to the objective. You know what I mean? For example, in football, um, I would not teach how exactly to pass the ball. I would just let them play. And if I'm he will, she or he 
will learn how to adapt the body to bring the ball wherever they want to bring the ball. And from that learning process is when they will learn the biomechanics and so on. Okay, um, um, for Keith, we have a final question then of this session uh, uh, from, from Zubin. Um, I'm sort of referring to sort of leading footballers uh, and sports, sportsmen and women in general. We'll, we'll talk about time slowing down. Um, and it mentions there was a point about breath control that Amy spoke about. Does that contribute towards the composure and calmness, a low heart rate? being in a mindfulness state, flow state. So I have to try to remember exactly the context that Amy, Amy mentioned it in, but I, I would say in a general sense, um, you know, something that we use in MSPE to try to help train this style of attention are present moment anchors, right? And so I know we've used that term anchor throughout this discussion. I haven't really defined it yet, but you know, the, these anchors, there are these parts of our present moment experience that we can tune into. And so one of the first ones that we introduce in MSPE and one of the foundational ones really in most mindfulness trainings is the breath. And, and part of why we pick the breath is because it's, it's both always a part of our present moment, right? So the running joke is if you're not breathing, if it's not part of your present moment, you've got big problems separate from any performance issue, right? So you're always breathing. Um, but also there is a relaxing element to breathing properly, as well as a performance benefiting element to breathing properly and circulating proper oxygen. So I think it is a very effective anchor. And, you know, what, what we often find in mindfulness by, by bringing your attention to the present moment, by letting go of all of these reactions, these distractions, these things that hijack our attention to the past and the future, there is something very relaxing about that. That's why relaxation is one of our performance facilitators. Um, one of the real confusing parts about this is we make the distinction, the goal of this training is not to relax. As soon as we make it a goal, like I must relax right now, right? It backfires on us. <laughs> if you've ever seen people like try to relax, like sometimes that can be really hard. Um, and so instead by, by inviting yourself to just be present and tune into what's happening and sort of let go of, of all the noise, that tends to be a very relaxing experience. So yes, I mean, I think the answer to that question is the breath being one example of a present moment anchor that can help facilitate that kind of experience. But in MSPE, you know, we start with the breath, but then we include body sensations and eventually we work up to sensations of the body in motion while we're performing in the sport at hand, right? So if you're a football player, while you're running, while you're kicking, while you're dribbling, right, being present with those kinds of experiences, they can also serve that same function just like the breath does um, as a present moment anchor. Fantastic. I don't know whether Amy, this is a final point. I just want to sort of talk about the breathing as an anchor, but uh, the verbal anchors, which obviously within a team sport will actually bring everyone in together within that performance sort of area. I mean, how are the, are the players across all groups, are they sort of brought into that and using these kind of verbal anchors within, within matches? Yeah, definitely. I mean, from when I, when I speak to players, they, they do utilize kind of, I suppose, more the internal anchors. Um, and although I said that kind of on that slide that there was a, there was a difference between the internal and external, I think the more that we've practiced, um, like this is going back two years ago. So the more that we've practiced, the more that transition, I believe, I haven't got antidotal kind of evidence or written evidence, but just from my experiences, it has changed. It has made a shift because of that internal side that like Keith elaborated on, it's always there. So they can pay attention to it where they're then, I suppose, waiting on that external cue, which might not come. Um, so again, training, training the players to pay attention to the, the physical sensations, to that breath awareness, I think it's really, like, really important. So yeah, I haven't really answered your question, but I'm going to leave it there. <laughs> no, 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 that's a great, great place to leave it. Um, Amy, a, a really big thank you for, for joining us today. Um, also to, to you, Keith and, and Alex, it's been like a really fascinating session which um yeah sort of highlighted lots of 
interesting areas and approaches to to mindfulness within within football and and with all great discussions sort of open up lots of areas where we hopefully can zoom in with with future sessions um but for today yeah a big thank you to you all again yeah thank you very much everyone really nice yeah, to speak thank to you all. my pleasure thank you steve thank you for having us